we got a topic. We do. We got a multiple top. It's finally May, May 2nd, the year 2023. Welcome aboard, everybody. You're listening to the Crushing Iron Podcast, and this is episode 681. 681, and I guess you're feeling pretty damn good this morning, buddy. I'm feeling a little saucy this morning, in a good way, a good <laughs> yeah, kind of sauce. Are. But listen, it's 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 kind of hard not to. You wake up, the sun's coming up, clear skies, light breeze, you know, 43 degrees. It's just gorgeous today. And it, it really does. It's, we talk about this a ton, but I don't think I've ever, because we, you know, we, we were both living in Tennessee last year and for, you know, for the last 20 years, most of our lives have been in Tennessee and they get all the seasons, right? We get fall, we get winter, spring, summer, everything. It's not as cold right there right. as it is consistently where we live now, you know, with me and Kansas and Wisconsin, but seasonal depression has always been a thing, right? It's been around for forever. You know, we, and we notice it and we talk about it a lot with um, our athletes and we hear from our athletes out, but I'll tell you just from like, random strangers that I've come into contact with from like yard people to, you know, people down the street, to uh, you know, parents at, you know, uh, sports stuff. I hear more people like openly talking about it than I ever have before in my life. Um, yeah. I just think I was depressed the last few years, you know, I got seasonal depression. I'm like, it's just, it's just interesting. Like how open people talk about things like that now, but how, but just, it just it does it it 100% highlights the impact that being outside and sunshine and vitamin D has on not just your body but your mind what it does for your mind and and i think and we won't go into this today cuz we've, we've got plenty of podcasts about it but you and i in the last you know 2 or 3 years have been so adamant about you know trying to really some, sometimes sternly, encourage people to get off their ass and get outside or mm-hmm. just generally get outside of their house, right? You know, get off the treadmill, get off your trainer, you know, go out and do things with people that's outside and how much better you feel, how much happier you are, regardless of the season. Um, and, and I think that's just, it's just, you got seasonal oppression because of temperature and, you know, and, and, you know, when the sun comes up in the morning or how early it get, you know, or how, you know, early the sun comes down in the evening, you know, now you get up and, you know, it's like quarter to six. I left for my run this morning. Was, the sun was already out, you know, and then it'll be out till 8.50 tonight. It's just that impact is like, it's it, to me, it's not a, yes, it's seasonal, right? But I think a lot of us get trapped into making it more not seasonal, but just how it encourages just straight up you know, depression, because it can be sunny, but if you're inside all day long, are you really getting the benefits? So, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to not feel kind of, I guess, energized and uplifted and, and motivated when you're doing things outside and you're kind of getting the, again, like the double benefit, you're outside, you're increasing fitness, you're, you're, uh, you know, increasing your well being and mental and emotional health. You're obviously getting a physical stimulus that's making you an overall healthier person. Then you've got all the extra benefits of being outside, it's just it's it's a it's the combo we all want that I think a lot of times we we lose sight of. But um, yeah, well, yeah, man, weather's great. Weather's yeah, great. it's for real though, man. It's like we, I mean, the last few years that you know, like it started off with this damn lockdown mentality, and I think it's and a lot of people start working at home, and we sit in our house, and and it is tougher to get out. I think for a lot of people, and it's a lot easier to get into that space and a lot more people are talking about depression and things like that. It's easier to do, you know, and it's, uh, you know, like I've always said, I mean, like the sun is probably the the best thing for you, Mm -hmm. you know, as far as health and energy and all these types of things. And, um, you know, I, you know, I go way back to the sunscreen thing. I don't even believe in that shit, but I think we need sun on our body and in our eyes and in our, you know, we need oxygen, all, you know, fresh air. And the last three years or whatever has kind of been the antithesis of that in a lot of ways. You know, we're all, a lot of people started working from home or by themselves and shit like that. And you don't, you know, I work down at that little space and you kind of have one too. And um, a lot of times nobody's really in there, but I'll go in there sometimes. And if I, I have a couple of people I know in there and if I see them right away in like the kitchen area and we talk for about a half hour 
or 15 minutes or something, my day is infinitely better than if right? I just go into a you know, shell, you know? So I, I, yeah, I agree. I think you just, that's why I was saying almost the other day, I, I was going to run around the house, but I decided I didn't, I wasn't feeling it. So I drove down to that, uh, Del Boca Vista where they have mm-hmm. a really nice running trail. I just, I needed to be around people and just get a, even a casual conversation can really lift you up, you know? 100%. These casual conversations lift me up. And yeah. we hope that our casual conversation lifts you up. It's first time I'm tuning in today. Welcome. We appreciate you giving us your time. We know you have quite a lot of options in the triathlon podcast universe and just podcasts in general terms are very valuable. So we appreciate you tuning in today. We cover it all. We do swim, bike, and run specific podcasts. We do race recaps and also a lot of race previews. But for the most part, Mike and I as coaches, athletes, best friends, we just sit back, relax, have an open honest discussion about what we're going through in life, not just as human beings, but also as coaches and athletes ourselves. We also talk frequently about what our own athletes are going through. Mike and I work with a wide range of athletes all across the globe from beginner level triathletes looking at their, looking at their first 5K or even sprint triathlon all the way up through elite level amateurs trying to get back to world championships and everyone in between if all over the globe. And we use the feedback loop we have with them and training peaks, emails, text messages and the like to drive the discussion of the day. We also frequently utilize our Facebook group like we will today. You can search that, Crushing Iron Group. Answer one simple question, we'll let you right in. Awesome people, fantastic community, solid resource in a uh, in a world, world for sure. And uh, in a sport that's oftentimes overcomplicated and can be confusing, uh, it's a solid, informative space with a lot of experience in there from athletes, again, that are that are more than qualified to uh, give you their uh, expertise and answer some of your questions. Uh, we'll do a Q&A like we will today. Uh, take the pulse of the community, try to answer as many questions as we can, uh, which sometimes we get through them all, sometimes we don't, but we always give it uh, the old uh, the old college try. Uh, but that's it. We don't do sponsors. We don't do ads, but we do have an agenda, and that's to keep you happy and healthy in your endurance sports journey. It's mm, a good agenda. Good. It's a, it's a solid agenda. Before, <laughs> no. before I, we go into the, the meat of the cast, a little housekeeping before I forget – and because basically, if we're being honest, we both like really suck at doing this is to uh, highlight the ways that you can support us. That's to go to the online uh, store on our website, c26triathlon.com. Uh, you can click on the online store and peruse the uh, merchandise that we have for sale. Uh, that's a outstanding way to support the community, support the podcast, and support what we do with C26 and uh, help us to keep going. So go in there, purchase some gear, uh, maybe even get a little uh, love note from Mike, which is, in my opinion, more than priceless and worth, worth the price of admission. Mm-hmm. Uh, share some with your friends. Um, and you can also uh, check out all the other things we offer on the website. We do have some camps coming up with limited availability. We have our Nashville camp that is in late June. Uh, easily our most popular camp. Uh, we've been with the one we've been doing for what six, seven years now. We've got a great schedule. Um, really, I'm super excited. Two pool sessions, open water session, the best bike riding you can find on um, the south on the Natchez Trace Parkway. Perfect roads, cl- you know, very limited traffic, some great run trails. It's just a really great time. Uh, it's a great time and a great time of year to be surrounded by awesome athletes and awesome people. Uh, we all ha- also have our triathlon camp in Madison, Wisconsin. That's the end of July. Have a few spots left for that as well. Uh, we're partnering with Garmin for that. They got some sweet, really sweet discounts that we'll have on Thursday night at Machinery Row uh, Bicycle Shop. Have a little pint night, I think, uh, for all the people. And uh, Garmin will be there to support us throughout that camp, along with some other uh, cool sponsors that are coming in that we'll announce in the next couple of days. Um, but it's a really great, great time of year to be a part of that. So if you're looking for a camp, regardless of speed, regardless of experience, regardless of goals, and what races you're doing, those are camps for you. They're time-based. Uh, we just have one hard, fast rule. No dicks, no divas. That's it. As long as you're a good person looking to have a great time with awesome people, we got a camp for you. So go again, go to the website, click on the camps tab, scroll down, find the camps that are for you. There's registration links uh, embedded in those. Or if you have any questions about those camps specifically, where to stay. We've got discounts uh, with hotels close by. So everything is kind of you know set out for you. Makes it very easy to come. So uh, again, if you don't find the information you need on the website, you can email uh, Summer, our operations manager at c26operations at gmail.com. 
Yeah. And before we get into the questions, I want to go back to your <clears throat> uh, moving up north thing. Because we were talking before the cast, and <clears throat> I said that I knew, uh, I felt like I, over the weekend I drank a lot of coffee and I was dehydrated, and I, my workouts were a little tougher than I felt like they should have been. And I do think there's some, I was thinking about this because, you know, I used to drink probably a lot more water when it was, because it was probably, you know, 20 degrees warmer on average, 15 degrees, av- you know, in Chattanooga and Nashville. It's harder to drink like yesterday in the, or Sunday in my run, it was 35 and rainy or whatever. And it's like hard to put down a lot of water. So I, th- I think I was really dehydrated. So I think there's something to paying attention to that. And it's not as easy, I think, some, for me anyway, to drink cold water or just water in general when it's cold. So I just want to put that out there because I think it, you know, last night I got home and I drank a bunch because I felt like I was way behind. And, and I can already tell today I have a different sort of, you know, that just general feeling you can have sometimes. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have, I feel like I'm kind of back today. I know you're way back, but I'm, I feel like (laughs) I'm kind of back back. compared to how I was, you know, just yesterday, even when I was throwing pole buoys at the wall and shit at the pool. (laughs) I was was like, thank God nobody was in there, man, because I was just in a shit mood, man. What's it take to get on probation at the Del Boca Vista? They don't really have anybody in the pool. So, you know, I figured as much. No lifeguard or anything. So I just kind of. No lifeguard? No. It's a, you know, it's a mature. Well, they pro- it's because they probably have like a hospice care wing at the at Del Boca Vista. They don't Dude, have it's lifeguards. attached to a hospital. <laughs> right, exactly. They're like, you're <laughs> most of your like end of life anyway. So like, what's the point? I know. Well, um, yeah. Nobody really swims. You know what I mean? That's They just, <laughs> aerobics. There's somebody there for the aerobic sessions, you know, of course. Yeah. I got like seven boards to take people out of the water. It's just all part. It is. That guy it's pushing the towel, you know, that towel bin thing on the wheels. He comes walking through the pool every once in a while just to check on it. That's a good man right there. <laughs> he is. Yeah. He probably strolls back to the lobby and gives him a thumbs up. He's good. He's good. Uh, he's, no good. he's good. <laughs> you forget your locker combo. I can help you. <laughs> I went down there yesterday, dude. That's a f- they are... <clears throat> The employees have had masks on until yesterday. Unbelievable. I was like, who are you people now? Yeah, older population, man. This is this is just a sign of where you go. Um, so, and if anything, it should tell you to go somewhere else and uh, be a part of a, a <laughs> younger. Because you're, you're, you're a young dude with a young soul. That's the last place you belong. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Anyway, After Sunday, I felt like I should have been down there in traction. <laughs> We uh we it's May, so we we decided to uh do our monthly Q and A today. Got some questions there. We're gonna get to uh as many of them as we can. And yeah, as always, the answers usually depends. We try to give you as much information as we possibly can, both scientifically based, experienced from both of us, but all ultimately it's up to you to make the best decision. Uh we also can't promise that you'll like the answer, but we'll give it to you straight. That's all we can do. First question out of the gate from Coach Nicole. How long? Coach, coach how long? bringing it. Yeah, she. Well, here's here's what I know. Like when our coaches pop in questions, what they're doing is they're, you know, how it's it's Seed always money. easier for your it's easier for your kid to listen to someone else that's not their parent. Like I, I can give Hayden the exact same tip, and he'll ignore it. But if he his coach tells him, he's like, oh, for sure, I, I got that. <laughs> so when I would see when I would see coaches like. Drop in these questions. What I'm what I'm really seeing and hearing is one of your own athletes asked you this question. They're not listening to you, so they're hoping to listen to us. And so her question is, how long should you do triathlon, participate in the sport, whatever, before signing up for a full Ironman? You know, um, you know, this is way too broad of a question. Um And, you know, it'll be one of those where people won't like the answer, but that's fine. A lot of people don't like my answers anyway, but I just give it to you like I see them. So if you want to, you know, participate today and listen, then uh, put on your Sunday best, slide on into your favorite pew and get ready for church. Because most athletes, if you're really going to get into the sport, not just not just do triathlon for a year, but try to get the most out of yourself. Two years minimum. Was what you should do. Two years. Now, there are 
a lot of caveats to that, right? Based on experience levels, like, you know, are you a, you know, cross country Boston marathon or, you know, whatever you got all this other experience. Are you on a timeline, right? You know, your kids are, you got kids on the way you're planning to, you know, you're, you're, you're married or you're single, but you got no kids and you, you're planning on having them and you know, life's going to get crazy and that's going to, you know, put a wrench in your plans, right? Or if you're a bucket lister who really doesn't care about the sport, doesn't care about doing triathlon, just wants to tell people that you did an Ironman. Got it. Like then do whatever you want, right? That's do whatever you want. It's your life. You make your own choices. Do your thing. Having said that, if you are an athlete that really wants to get the most out of yourself and do actually not just do an Ironman, but really kind of give it, give it a good shot and have a good performance and know what to base your experience off of in two years. I mean, I, neither one, I, I can, you and I both have very different experiences getting into the sport, right? You did an Ironman your first year. I was in the sport for three or four years before I did my first one. Um, but I will say that the biggest time improvement I've ever had has been in that two year span from my first Ironman ever. So that was my first Ironman ever was Ironman Florida back in oh God, 2003 or four. No, 2006 or seven, something like that. A long time ago. And I think I was like 13 hours and whatever in change. And then I took a year off. I did 70.3. I did short course something. Came back again and did an Ironman uh, Arizona and did a 1030. So it was a pretty close to a three hour time jump off very similar courses, right? Flat to flat. It wasn't like I did a hilly course and a flat course. Very, very similar courses. And I saw without question the biggest jump, not just in fitness, but in understanding my body, understanding what was required. The first time I did it, I was just kind of doing the distance. So, you know, really it comes down to what you want to get out of your first experience. But also remember that we are, most athletes are type A and that they want to do it their, their best. And that you will then start to compare everything against your first. And so I just think that, you know, ultimately development with as an athlete should be your number one priority. And then doing the the distance when it seems to fit into your life at the best time, or you feel like you're ready to do it. But again, do you want to be a a completer, right? Someone who just goes out. My my goal today is to just get in and out of the 17 hour you know benchmark. Totally fine. I want to complete it. I want to be done. And then you have the competers, right? I want to compete either against myself, right, and get the fastest time I possibly can. Compete against myself in a previous time, right, in the same course, or compete against other people in my age group or the field, right? There's a very two different mindsets, completers and competers. And that also, I think, plays into the, you know, the um, the decision-making process. But again, for the development side, yeah, I, I, th- I, think, I think two years, but you did it the exact opposite, but I'm sure you have a lot of input <laughs> on, on, on both of those. Yeah, no, I, I, I tend to agree with what you're saying. I think that my case was unique because I was, um, just, I was just, I was on the couch and I was about 50 and I just got upset. I was like, all right, I got to change everything here. So I got kind of, um, you know, I started running. <clears throat> really, I went from when I started triathlon. I probably went from my first sprint to Ironman in probably fifteen months. I'm guessing. I did a summer triathlon in the year and a half a year, and then November or September later, I did Wisconsin. But, but I I went I went in hard and like you made a great point. I think you know like I didn't have, you know, the family concerns and the kid concerns and everything like that. I hated my job. So I was taking long lunch breaks and swimming and shit like that. And I just, I didn't care. You know, I just, that's what I was doing. It became my job almost. And, um, of course that's the start of the crushing iron blog back then. And Mm -hmm. so I was really into it and I'm not going to lie, man, out for the first, you know, five months, I was sore all the time, but for some reason I just had this drive in me. And then, um, you know, three months after my first sprint, we signed up for Ironman. I had no idea. I mean, it was just like the fear of it and the excitement of it pushed me. And, you know, I, I just got really motivated and, uh, 
um, you know, I was lucky to be around the right people like you and, you know, the guys we were training with and, and it, and it helped. And <clears throat> a lot of it sucked because I, I was really, we talk about, you know, when you start, you know, you're always hitting PRs and stuff and training and you're every, it's almost like every day for a year, I was like basting myself. <laughs> it was like a crazy ride because I was so n new to everything that every time I got a little bit better, I was just like, wow, this is crazy. And, uh, yeah, so I went up, I mean, I actually had a sub 12, my first one up at Wisconsin, which was like miraculous. But like I was talking about last year or last podcast, I had a super stretch goal on that and it ended up coming in or the, at least my mid goal came in, but I don't know. I think, uh, I think a lot of it depends on your life situation for sure. And like you said, if you have a run background or, um, cycling background swims too, but just endurance in general, I think that really helps you. Cause that was like the whole, you know, first year for me is like, I had no idea what endurance sports was, it was about. I mean, how would you even think about it or how to, you know, quote unquote jog versus run to first base or run out of double and shit like that. That was like my mentality. So I had to really adapt to this concept of pacing. And for me, that was probably the hardest part was the pacing just to really understand that and, and work through that because my brain was just wired totally differently. But yeah, I, I don't know. Time, no, lifestyle. I agree. I agree with what you said about, you know, where you also find yourself in life. You know, are you in a spot where you got more time than usual or you foresee life becoming a lot busier and a lot more demanding and a lot different and you won't have as predictable of a timetable? That's, you know, the, the, again, we, and we say this a lot with athletes when they talk about picking the right race and picking the, picking the right time of year is, you know, stop picking it about just the location, but start out with like, you know, what time of year gives you the most opportunity. And any, any time you hear any pro or athlete talk about, you know, one of the most important pieces of their life. And again, while you can't compare training and, and stuff like that to age groupers is that their number one goal is to limit all outside life stress. That's it. Limit outside life stress so that during recovery periods, you can actually recover from your training. And, and that is again, something that, that most age group athletes, we just don't have the luxury you know, for you're married, you got kids, you got, you know, jobs, right. Traveling isn't your job. You got those other things to, you know, manage and things. And so it's, um, you know, that again, you, you said that'd be, that would be the biggest caveat uh, for me. Um, Joe Abrava, and I'm sure I can't wait. I'll get crucified for this one, but that's yes. fine. Uh, on, emphasis on weightlifting or swimming during the off season. Uh, can't get your ass in the pool. I just seriously like there's well, unless you're you. No, for me, go swim. <laughs> I mean, like the, there's weightlifting should be. A, a, and a supplement. It can't um, replace swim, bike, and run. It can allow you, right, doing foundational exercises, plyometrics, whatever it is. It can allow you to have better running economy. It can allow you to produce a little more, you know, short term, higher power. But get your ass in the pool. It's triathlon, and you get all these arguments all the time about, you know, and and. The fact of the matter is, is a lot of weightlifting you do is actually counterproductive to what you're trying to do and you're, what you're trying to accomplish within long, especially if you're doing long distance sports. But the, the fact is, is that most people who will get on their soapbox and tell you about how weightlifting has really helped their FTP or all these other things is, is that I guess really could feel a huge, uh, huge benefit. Um, you just don't want to go swim. You just rather lift, which is fine. But just say that. Just say, I don't like swimming. I'd rather lift. And telling myself that weightlifting really, really benefits triathlon and how much better I'm getting. Just stop saying it. Just stop saying it makes me happier to weightlift. That's fine. Do your thing. But if you can't swim and you can't swim well, then stop wasting your time weightlifting. Go swim. 
I mean, I, again, like I will get crucified for this, I'm sure, but that's just a fact. It's just a fact. You can ask any coach, what should I pray? Swimming. 100% you should swim because, one, you're probably not that great at it. Joe, I don't know what your sometimes are, but even for somebody like me, right, that I could, you know, I'm, I'm planning on swimming this afternoon. I could swim, I'll swim 1,500, 2,000. You know, I'll probably be in the 120s. Even for me, I should swim more than once a week. I should swim twice a week. And then once I, or then I should move to three times a week. And then I should move to four times a week. And once I'm doing four times a week, then I should go up in yardage. I should be in like the one teens before I'm even considering, oh, and that if I have extra time, should I allocate it to weightlifting? If I do have extra time, should I really be allocating it to weightlifting? Or maybe I should add in a, another bike ride for the week. Because if I can do an extra hour this week, and that's four hours a month, over the next four months, that's 16 hours. That's a lot. Like there's, again, the people that, oh, weightlifting has just been a game changer for me. Yeah, by maybe like, you know, massaging your ADD about staying focused in triathlon, sure. Or you just like to lift, which is fine. It's your journey. It's your choice. You can do what you want. But unless you've, unless you've maximized the amount of time you have swim, bike, and run, and then you have extra time, right, to get a massage or go to the physio or whatever it is you need to, whatever it is you need to do, then maybe add in some some lifting, right, or some strength. I would I consider it strength sessions, um, that'll actually help you out. And then I tell athletes that, like you know, you can do that, but you know, depending on what kind of lifting you're doing, it might hurt your, you know, your what you're really trying to accomplish with your aerobic you know, capacity and, and your, the rate in which you produce lactate, all these things. But, you know, again, people like to lift. They have same, the same people who love to lift say that, you know, stretching, touching their toes before they go run a 5k really helps their performance. Um, I, all I would like to say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to say actually a little bit more than you think probably because there, I have no problem. And in fact, I think lifting is good for you, especially if you get old, after you're getting old, but I had this conversation with an athlete the other day about lifting. I'm like, you know, if you want to be your best triathlete, triathlete, I don't think it's the way to go, man. I mean, I think like if you want to do strength training, like you're saying, and for me, it's always just, let's just keep it to body weight because that like, can you go do five pull-ups? I mean, like everybody listening, I wonder what the percentage of people is that can just do a pull-up or five, probably not many. And you know, different things like push-ups. But the other thing I was saying to him him was, man, just w- if you want to get stronger and be better in the sport, work that core almost every day. And I think we neglect the shit out of our core, you know. That, to me, is one of the things that if you want to be a strong triathlete, work your core. Yeah, agreed. I mean, because, you know, because this goes back to, like, I remember reading – um Tim Ferriss had a book, The 4-Hour Body. I'll never forget it because I tweeted at him a long time ago. Because in the book, he said, "I'll," because he was planning to do a 50K or something like that or a 50-miler. And he was like, I'm going to do a 50-miler. And, and this guy I'm working with, the hack guy, the NFL combine guy or something. I mean, he had different, like, like this guy was helping him. He goes, I guarantee you if you increase your deadlift and your 10K time, if you just, you know, work on a 10K and do deadlifts, you'll be able to run a 50K. Now, do I think that's reasonably possible? Yeah. But anyway, so I was really interested because that was right when I was getting into this sport and everything and I was reading that book and I kept waiting for his like 50K and everything. And you know, I, kept, I tweeted, I was like, hey man, where's this at? You know, and I looked it up and he never even did it. So um, yeah, like w- lifting is good. I mean, I think a lot of people want to do it just because they want to look good too and everything like that and there's a fine line between you know a triathlon body and a lifter's body i mean it's a different story right so if you want to be good at triathlon i I just i don't know if most people are able to mix the two i mean it's a it's a it's a big ask for me especially if you're trying to do heavier stuff which is counterproductive to long course racing so right you know yeah, I mean, it's, and I can't tell you how many, you know, I'm not going to get on, I'm going to get like 17 emails from CrossFitters right now telling me that I'm an idiot. Um, Danny, in your opinion, with her recent success at gravel racing, have we seen the last of Heather Jackson doing triathlon? 
I've always been a fan of hers, and she ran with me for a bit last year at Lake Placid cheering me on, so I'm just curious. Thank you. She's done. She's done. She's been done. Whether she admits it or not is another thing, but I'm pretty sure she has like admitted that she. I think she made a very smart choice in moving on from triathlon because she was no longer competitive at the big races with the big payouts that – that generate a lot of, you know, sponsor bonuses and stuff like that. Or she just wasn't, you know, she's five years, three or four, maybe, maybe, maybe three, probably four, but three to four or five years ago, that's when she was, you know, doing really, really well, had some good um, results in Kona uh, as a top American. But yeah, I mean, that's the sport has kind of passed her by. She's way, she comes out of the water way too far behind, way too far behind to even be remotely in the conversation of winning, big time races, but, um, but yeah, I mean, she's a super likable person and, and she, I think she's done a, an admirable job of, um, uh, you know, continuing to market herself and making herself valuable in endurance sports. And she moved on to gravel racing, which is a, another, you know, sport that's growing. So I think she's done a, an excellent job doing that. Uh, you know, got nothing but great things to say about her. I've never met her, but, you know, she seems very likable. She's been great for the sport, um, and it seems like she's doing what she loves, which is, which is all you can really ask anybody to do is just do, you know, do what you love. And she probably stopped loving that and wants to love something else, and she's doing good at it again. So more, you know, more power to her. So I hope she can test continued success in that area. But yeah, I think she's. She, no, I don't think she has done with triathlon. Uh, yeah, I would have no idea on that one, of course. Um, but is is she still in the Wadi stuff or? I don't know. They, they, I don't know. The, again, we can, we, we, they did a whole bike, uh, you know, split from Wadi, and now there's like all these different brands that have come out of it. You guys, it's like, it's, it's honestly like one of those things you don't talk about. Oh, okay. Sorry politics, for bringing it up. Politics, politics, religion, taxes, no, diets, and, you know, or do you support Wadi or Heather Jackson? I mean, that you just don't touch those two people are very passionate about stuff like that. Wow. Um, next question, Kevin Wolf in pool swimming. Why are breaks between sets so short in running and cycling? There are often time. There's often time to settle down in between work intervals, but with swimming, it's like rest for rest for two flaps of a hummingbird's wing and then back to another. <laughs> what gives? Um, excellent analogy, uh, Kevin. Um, you know, there's He's a couple good, reasons. Man, why. I'm telling you. Yeah, there, there's a couple of reasons why. One, you know, most for most athletes, right? Like when you are swimming an interval, you probably don't. Um, you aren't swimming hard enough like you would on a bike or run interval to deserve significant amounts of rest. Right. You're, and even if you're going like all out, like I do, we do a lot of equal rests. If you're doing, um, you know, uh, you know, is all out like zone four swims. Like if you're doing a 25 all out, then you swim and you do it in 20 seconds and you get to rest 20 seconds. So you match it. But there's also, you know, some bike rides where you'll go all out for a minute, rest for a minute. You know, that's like zone four. The, the problem with swimming, and you see this especially with, with triathletes and, and age group athletes, is that, you know, you're you're doing 10 200s pull or 10 200 zone two. That's easy. Like, you shouldn't even honestly, like, need that much of a an aerobic break. Like, that's me saying that, for example, you've got a 30-minute zone two run. So for every four minutes of zone two, you're going to, you get to stand, you get to have static rest. So standing still for 20 seconds, you'd be like, why? I don't need that. Right. It, or, or same thing for cycling. You know, I want you to do, you know, four, you know, let's say a 200 takes you three minutes. I want you to do four, you know, three minute zone two intervals on, you know, 20 seconds rest. You're like, I don't even need this 20 seconds. The, the, for a lot of athletes, the 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 rest is only even needed to kind of just reset and make sure your form gets back. But even on longer sets, a lot of athletes don't take long enough breaks. Like if you're doing 300s, 400s, you know, and you're doing them actually hard, not like you think they're hard. Because again, triathletes have a lot of like two speeds. It's either don't drown or all out. Um, and then, 
you know, it, then they then they have rest intervals and not rest intervals. And but some of your rest intervals should be a lot longer than you really have them. Like we, some of our rest intervals are a minute, minute and a half, depending on how long it is, because you want them to really get the most out of the next session. Uh, but a lot of it's based on intensity and form, and that's why you know if if you think you're you're only getting you know two flaps of a hummingbird's wing for <laughs> for rest, um, then you know, then you should, you know, maybe add a little bit. But having said that, you know, a lot of the the rest interval manipulation that you see across all sports is to allow yourself, is to keep your heart rate up, but allow yourself to reset and do more work within that intensity. And, and that's always the point, right? It's to not do, I could ask you, you know, Kevin to go swim, you know, 10 100s all out on, you know, or I could ask you to swim a thousand all out and you probably make it to like 600 before your, your form starts to fail and you can no longer swim at intensity because you don't have the anaerobic capacity or even aerobic capacity to extend that long enough and swim it straight. But what we can do is allow you to keep your heart rate up, right? Because then ask you to rest for 10 or 15 seconds, grab a sip of water, reset your mentality, heart rate still up, right? And then go after it again. And you're and give your muscles a little bit of time because that's that's the biggest negative you or not drawback you see with age group athletes. They can't hold form. And so then you're working really hard with bad form. That's how you have injuries happen. So um, again, it, it got, a lot of it goes back to the ability to have different levels of of intensity when most athletes don't. And that that's one of the the drawbacks for you know not swimming enough, maybe spending too much time in the weight room is the more <laughs> the more the more you swim, or opportunities you have to have different speeds, you know, to be able to swim a controlled easy you know I, I always tell people you you've reached your you know i think you've reached full-on swim capability when you can adjust your own stroke you know and do 40 seconds difference from your slowest hundred to your fastest hundred in the water because that's about controlling speed and controlling form but the 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 most athletes have you know two speeds like i said one don't drown and two as you know as fast as I can go and they don't have multiple seats because you don't swim enough. So again, it's not something that's very different from cycling and running in that aspect for, for most triathletes, not all, but most. Yeah. And you can't really stop in the lake, you know? Uh, I was, yeah. but, so I think I, in a way I've always thought about it that, that way too, is that, you know, I don't, I want to have as short, you know, of breaks as possible, you know, to my fitness. And I do notice that when, like you're saying, Sometimes I'll get into later last season where I'm like going after some even 500, four or five hundreds and I stop and I know I have like, I don't know, I'm going to take like 30 seconds or a minute or something like that. And I always have an itch to get going again. It's really weird when, you know, the more you get into it. But uh, I like what you said about the, um, the reset part of it, because it is a remarkable almost if you just take, you know, say you are doing 50s hard and you take, you know, five seconds or whatever. It, it's amazing how much difference that does make. And I've been noticing that even on the run, like sometimes if I just, you know, like I'll, a lot of times I'll do walk run even for a minute, but sometimes I'll just go out and uh, I'm not doing a walk run, but I'll, I'll mix in like 10 steps of walking. Just an, I don't mm -hmm. know. And it's amazing what that does because it does reset your form. I think a, a lot of times we're not, in good enough sh shape actually to continue holding a form for so long. So sometimes just the ability to kind of take that little uh, pause and just kind of recalibrate things in your, in your walk or even on the bike, like sometimes, you know, everybody's, like, you know, you're doing those four by eights or whatever like that. And everybody wants to have five minute break between them, but it's amazing what a couple minutes does, you know, just a couple minutes off of that intensity and it just does. It's sort of like, you know, walking an aid station for a few minutes on the run course. It just, it's just amazing. To me. It's that in course recovery that just blows my mind. Actually, you and again, like most athletes, if you're doing, if you want to get in four thousand, you know, yards for the day, you know, and you're doing, you know, twenty two hundreds instead. 
then instead of having you swim 4,000 straight where your mind wanders after, I don't know, about 300 yards and you start to like solve the world's problems and you make a to-do list and you make your grocery list and you think about this and that and you haven't thought about what to do or what's going to make you better or the right form at all, period. You're just mindlessly swimming. And what what 2200s does is allows you to be purposeful, right? So, and it's fun. I've always done this, like, you know, swimming uh, straight through. So let's say you take, you know, you're doing, you're doing 20, whatever, 2200s, like I said, you know, you could, you could swim 4,000 all the way through. And let's say you're going to, you know, eventually fade out because you don't have, you know, the capacity to swim 4,000 straight, right? And so you, you end up averaging like, you know, two minutes per 215 per per hundred. Well, you could split it up into, you know, 20 two hundreds and you could only take, right. Even a, a long break. If you're doing zone two of 20 seconds rest, right. Well, if you take that out over the end, you know, and like, you, that allows you right to average high one forties, low one fifties with great form. It only took you like six and a half minutes longer <laughs> to do that whole set of doing 20 two hundreds, right. Versus swimming 4,000 straight at a slower speed with bad form and no intention. Like six and a half minutes. That's it. It's, it's, the, it's total cumulative rest for all those intervals. That's nothing. I mean, that's the you know chance that you run into the, to the talker, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or not talker, right? That, that adds 23 minutes, 40 minutes, 80 minutes to your swim session. You know, is, who knows? You know, it's like, you know, or you come on deck, you know, t- two minutes late and you miss the last lane and I get away for 20 minutes. So it's six and a half minutes, but to do it right and to get the yardage win, yardage in at a better intensity with better form and great intention. Um, and that's why you see a lot of those intervals that are short. Yeah. No, I like that a lot, man. And it's just always this comp- confidence question, right? I, I, got, I just got to swim the distance straight. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll tell you, man. Last year, I just became, I finally became a, I buying in on this stuff, you know, the, well, <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause I get that same, you know, you kind of put off the, I think that's what happens is when people put off the pool because of weightlifting, usually, um, they don't get to a place where they are confident. You know, like if you did do 20, 200s and you were strong the whole way through and you're at that point, you, yeah, you know, you're not going to have a problem in the race. You know what I mean? But people don't believe that. It's hard to believe. I remember having that conversation when, when I started out at the lake. Remember? We would mm-hmm. do, it was like, they were about 175s maybe to, out in the buoy and back, 200, let's say. Out and back hard. Or out easy in hard. Or out hard in, you know, whatever. Just like some really serious shit out in the open water. And we get done with <clears throat> training in that morning and it'd be like, I don't know, 2,000 yards or something. I'd be like, man, are we ever going to go? No, trust me. This is a, this is just as good, you know, because <laughs> we were ripping it, man, and working hard. And I just think that that's a, a confidence thing because you didn't get enough yardage a lot of times. And so you have to go, I got to go see if I can get this distance. Great observation. But, yeah, that's the way we do it. Next question by Kurt. Uh-oh. Similar to the Joe. No, the answer is it depends, but here it goes anyway. As season ramps up, I generally feel like strength activity gives way to aerobic activity. As long as the workout isn't lift until destruction, is lower body lifting on swim days and upper body lifting on bike and run days a reasonable tactic to keep at least some weight training? I know core drives the bus. When you you nailed that. Um, so that will be added most days as part of the warm up. You know, I mean, I think we cover all that. I mean, I. I <laughs> Again, a lot of people, again, especially as you get older, especially if you're female, you need to, you know, continue to add in, you know, the, the, my biggest issue is, is just, I think the term lift or weightlifting, you know, as people envision, you have to do deadlifts and, and squats and, you know, cleans and, and all these, and like, you don't like you, you need you know, for most people, you should be able to do all. You should be able to do your foundational strengths up at home without going to the gym. Because if you got to go to the gym to do it, then you better be going to the gym to swim. <laughs> if you're taking that much time, um, 
But you know, it, I, I I would also caution on the heavy weight on bike and run days, um, because you know, again, even if you're not you know going until failure, I mean, that's obviously you know, I would I would uh, honestly argue that your way of doing it is the opposite way of uh, what I would do because you're not giving your arms and legs a rest day. You're always doing something for them. So if you're going to do arm day, do your swim, then do upper body, you know, so after you've swam, right? So your upper body lifting isn't negatively impacting your swim, right? Because swimming is primary because you're a triathlete or unless you're a weightlifter who does triathlons, most of you are triathletes trying to do some lifting is to swim first, then go do your arms. Because you're you don't have to worry so much about your form on your curls or your bench press or whatever it's doing. Those aren't those aren't really hard movements to to master. And then you give your upper body a break for a day or two because you're doing legs. It, but doing them alternate days, so say you swim on one day, you swim hard, and the next day you do lifting. And it's like there's no break. And then you go back to the pool. And you're going to have really shitty form because your arms are tired because you swam longer than you did upper body. And then so you're starting to tired. So you're going to lack on form. So it's going to hurt your swimming. So in my opinion, you actually double them. Like same thing on bike and run is to do, you know, do your bike first, you know, or, or if you're going to, if you're going to lift legs, lift and then easy ride as recovery or, and then same thing you do same thing with, with running. But if you're doing intervals, then I would definitely just not have anything else on that day. Um, but again, it's, there's, it depends on, again, your definition of, of strength or lift or weightlifting. You know, some people, it's, they picture, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the, you know, Mr. Olympia. And then the other people picture, you know, uh, you know, triathlete, you know, Johnny at the club doing plyometrics, you know, there's a lot of different versions of, of what people consider lifting or strength. But, you know, for most people it's, uh, you know, it should be, you know, stuff you can do at home. Man, it's just an interesting question because you grew up swimming Mm -hmm. and you're good at it. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I watch some of the Boston Marathon or I, I watch, you know, the high end endurance events and I don't really see too many athletes that are jacked. You know, I think no, I that, <laughs> well, I'm just saying because I think a lot, you know, a lot of people that are at the top end of, of this sport have been doing endurance for a long time. And I think that we kind of like, I don't know if it's a hack world or whatever but like we're all or a lot of us are trying to catch up we're trying to make up for lost time you know my thing was i i rode my bike all the time when i was a kid and i got into mountain biking early in my life and it just comes naturally to me i don't think personally that lifting is going to help my bike that much as much as putting in more miles because that's where i struggle it's the Mm -hmm. it's the endurance aspect of it that most of us struggle with, and I think we're looking for that, you know, extra strength. And we, yes, it's about strength. Ironman specifically is about being strong, but I don't know if it's that type of strong. I, I, I just don't really know, but my gut tells me that when I'm in the best shape for an Ironman, I swim a crap ton and three, like 3000 feels like nothing. I get to that point. Um, 4,000, 5,000, that kind of stuff is happening. And I know when I'm in my best bike shape, I am riding long, you know, I, I, I've always been pretty good about the shorter kind of hard interval stuff during the week, but it's always been the longer rides. It just kind of like build up your overall endurance and strength for that type of activity. You know, it's like, you can be, I mean, like, I'm sure there's some really good, strong lifting people that can't ride more than, you know, 10 miles, you know? So I don't, you know, it's like, it's an endurance sport. Um, I do think that strength is the massive part of it. I just think that body weight kind of strength stuff is, is really what you need. And I've talked about this a long time. I think like when I'm in my best with yoga, I feel really strong in endurance Mm -hmm. sports. I don't necessarily think I could, you know, pick a car off a baby or something like that, but you know, that's all adrenaline. So how do you control that kind of stuff? Yeah. I mean, and quickly, like there was, I think it was last year, it was an article and it was outside magazine or their magazine. They 
they were they were saying, oh, it was kind of titled like, you know, do we need to rethink strength training's importance in endurance sports? Because it looked at the top marathoners, the top triathletes, and the top guys that just won the Tour de France. And none of them lifted. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, like you said, I mean, nothing against it's, lifting. It's, it's just a choice. Again, yeah, again, it's, again, it's a choice. Last one from my man, Hal Olson. What location or locations do you think deserve to have an Ironman? <laughs> there are a lot of races, but there doesn't seem to be very many new locations for the full distance. I'm glad they're bringing back Ironman Coeur d'Alene, but they've already canceled Waco, Tulsa, Alaska, and I'm sure others I'm not aware of. Just curious what you guys think would be a compelling case for a city not yet represented in the lineup. My vote would be to return to Austin, Texas or Minneapolis, Minnesota. Sorry, Madison, but it's not the same. <sighs> what? I got it. I think he's what he's saying is Minneapolis and Madison are different. And I would agree with that. I Listen, I've been saying for years that Minneapolis should get a 70.3 or a full. Now, the challenge is the type, the time of year you're going to put it in. And then that time of year is going to ultimately and obviously overlap with Madison more than likely just because of the long winter that those states have. But Minneapolis is a very, very popular city that has a obviously big names, big sports teams, a lot of triathletes are there. Um, yeah, I think Minneapolis would be a great one. Austin, Texas, give me a, the hardest pass of all hardest passes. Um, <laughs> no, um, I'll, I'll pass on Austin, Texas. There used to be a race there and there wasn't because the roads are shit. And, now, yeah. with how many people live there, you think all the all the millennials, tech entrepreneurs, and Silicon Valley that relocate, you think they want a triathlon? No, they don't. They just want to hop in their Tesla, put it on, you know, auto drive, and and get to work. They don't want to be interrupted. You're not going to see one in Austin, Texas. I can guarantee that. Minneapolis, sure. I yeah, Waco done. Tulsa, this is last year. Alaska last year, great idea, but done. But to me, Alaska was very similar to like the Lake Tahoe and Ironman New York. Um, Great idea, awesome location, but a one and done. Um, I there are uh, ultimate, you know, there are other rumors that Ironman St. George won't come back next year, but it'll be a, a 70.3 again. I believe Des Moines is slated to become go back to an Ironman next year because when they signed their deal, it was to alternate Ironman 70.3, Ironman 70.3. So that could be another. A uh, full distance race that's somewhat early in the year to complement Texas, which is late April. Um, you know, ultimately, I, I honestly, I, I love college towns for for races. I think those are some of the best locate. This my favorite races have all been in college towns: Louisville, Madison, and Tempe, Arizona. College towns. What about Muncie? Negative. Hard pass on the Muncie. Um, <laughs> it's, Jesus. What about yeah, Madison? But Madison, yeah, I mean, like, no, I, it's in the fact that Muncie got like voted best overall race venue. I'm like, are you serious right now? Like, you've obviously never been there. I mean, I'm not going to hate on Ball State, but I think, but the, but there's what well, you you're not wrong when you say Muncie because it's been around for 20 years, right? Like, that's here's my thing find a city that wants it that is willing to keep it and that won't just have it for two years, but it'll have it for 20. That that's if, to me, like that's what I, that's what I would want to see. And I would be the first person to sign up at, or if it ever went back to Louisville, that, that was one of my favorite races, regardless of what the city's like these days, I, I would go back to there in a heartbeat. Um, they definitely, I mean, I, I would just would. So find a, find a nice, cool college town, you know, that wants you to come college towns always have, you know, fun little places to go. So, I mean, or most of them do, um, put one there, you know, somewhere like that, but yeah, definitely not Austin, Texas. I'll way pass on that. It's like, Hey, you want to put one in Los Angeles? Nope. I'm good. Yeah. I think that's it, man. You, I mean, you brought up Louisville and for me, I, I just think it's like Minneapolis and all, those cities are too big, man. I, I just don't think they give a shit about an Ironman event. That's a challenge. They could have, you know, um, an arts and craft show and have everybody contained in their big, you know, dome or something like that and, and make 
10 times the money without having to jack around with cops and closing mm-hmm. streets and dealing with traffic and all the people in their city getting pissed off. The big cities can make money other ways. I think it needs to be like you're saying, I think college town is a good measuring stick, but I would, I mean, obviously it's tricky because this has to be a big enough college where there's enough hotels and, and that sort of thing. So for me, it's towns like that you don't think of that could use a, a boost, you know, that maybe you would get behind it. Like Rockford, yeah, Illinois. Even yeah. though uh, Rockford, Illinois. <laughs> it does. Know. It's gotta be it the partnership has to be mutual where you both see that they're gonna get something out of it. And that's like you said, like Minneapolis, Los Angeles, Austin, Nashville, all these places where you're like, oh, they would, you know, kill them. like, yeah, but the city's like, yeah, I'm good. I don't want, I can't interrupt the streets and 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 you know disrespect the the community and they're gonna complain about it. You know, and all we got to really do is invite an AAU tournament in town and they'll, you know, triple the revenue. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. you know, find, again, find a cool call, but something that can stay, right? That's got staying power. That's, that's something that I'm, I just think is really great because it gives people time to plan. And, and yeah, there's, there's less fulls, but there's more 70.3s than ever right now, which I, and I think they're listening to their, their listener base by providing more opportunities for, at the race distance people want to do the most. Um, but yeah, those, those many, I mean, I'd love to see one in Minneapolis, but again, like you said, that's a, just a giant big time city that there's no way there's going to have one. It'd be like, you know, asking Nashville if they want to have one and then like triathlon. No, but what we'd rather have is, you know, 60 billion bachelorette parties downtown. That's what we really have. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, if, if you get, you don't have to find a city, you have to find a politician who is willing and wants to make it work. I mean, that, that was the thing when we talked to, um, McKinney Hammond about race venues and stuff like that. He said, you just don't know how much the local government and their support of it goes. If they don't want it, it's not there. You know, a lot of people, you know, can, and Iron Man's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, a lot of it is like, if you're not wanted, you're not wanted that that's the handicapped handcuffed nature of being a race events organizer is you are 100% dependent 100% dependent on someone else and the community and votes and legislature and all these kind of things on cutting off roads and swim space and run court. I mean, like you are at the mercy of all those people. So yeah. it all has to go right. So when they drop races, it's like people hate you know, on Ironman because they're the ones that, you know, pick races and, you know, they break contract or whatever. But ultimately, if, if, a, if a city doesn't want you, they don't want you. And frankly, you shouldn't want to go support that city. Like that, that, that was my thing when they, when they decided to move Conan. Like if you listen to Andrew Messick's interview, like we, we ruined it. We ruined it. Triathletes ruined it. Period. We wanted a bigger race. We wanted more people. We wanted more males. We wanted more females. Well, we can't do it on one day. That's too many. So let's do it two days. Fuck the island. Fuck the local community. We want it. Let's do it. And then they did it. And you know what they said? We don't want this anymore. Mm. We don't want it. Yeah. We're, We're good. Don't come back next year. Or we can handle the men, but this two-day thing, I know we thought it would work, but you wanted too much. You got greedy. And so now, and now just because it's not in Kona, <laughs> it's just funny. Now everyone's, you know, everyone was pro-male, pro, you know, pro-female, you know, equal opportunity. But now that they've had to split it because we wanted more, well, now no one, now one's not about that. Oh, two locations is the worst. Like two different I think. You, we did it to ourselves by being too damn greedy about a city and an infrastructure that can barely handle the two, 2,500 people that were there. But Iron Man got greedy with more registrations. The people got greedy with how many more people you had to have be there. Everybody got greedy. And when you're at the mercy of a city, again, in local politics, it, you screw around and you mess up, then they're like, you know what? Maybe, like you said, then maybe it's not worth it. You know, maybe it's just not worth it. And then they tried to make it right. 
right? The best version of her, right? By, you know, spending the men, you know, the men Denise and then keeping the women's at the women in Kona and they're on different dates, whatever that be. Oh, that's just not good enough. Like, isn't ever good enough? You know, mm-hmm. just keep Kona 2000 people and, you know, a thousand man, a thousand men, a thousand female, whatever. Keep it small, keep it exclusive like it's supposed to be and stop pandering to, you know, 50,000 people that go to Kona every year. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, topic. we got ourselves here and that's why, you know, that's what people look around and ask ourselves, do we really want to host a big race? Well, I, I contend that Ironman helps build cities. If they, I, I we saw that in Chattanooga. I mean, mm-hmm. remember it, when you, you told me the first, the Chattanooga was getting Ironman. I was like, what? That seems crazy. But, because it was kind of a sleepy little town. It was not, we were in Nashville at the time, and we were like, ah. But that was really cool. And I remember that when you bike out down there, all that you know, shit on the right-hand side over there, all those condos, and that, none of that was there. You know, like what? I guess it was 10 years ago now. But, I mean, that city is absolutely blown up. And I think a lot of it has because you got affluent-type people with money that come in and see your town. It's like, shit, maybe I wouldn't mind having a place here or whatever. And it's a great little training town. And um, I think that that's what the city has to be more than just a, you know, traditional city that's big. I mean, if you can find a city that's kind of on the cusp of blowing up like Chattanooga, to me, that's the money. That's the way to go. They they need to find like a, you know, like a Omaha, Nebraska, or a, you know, a nice, cool college, you know, midwestern town. Finish on the football. I mean, just you know, again, like you said, towns that you got to find a city that really wants it, right? Then and everyone, oh, it's not. There's nothing, you know. The course isn't, you know, too scenic, or there's not enough to do there. I'm like, yeah, but would you rather, you know, have a little bit better? hotel to stay in and a better restaurant to eat at, but the race is only there for a year and a half because you can't go back because they're like, eh, you guys are way too much trouble. That's just, that's the nature of, of race organizing and race event management stuff. So, um, again, like we said a few weeks ago, you know, give those people props. Um, not just a my man water boy at you know mile seventeen on the Iron Man, um, but that's it. That's all we got to today. I'm sure we'll get a lot of uh, a lot of fanfare from today for that. But uh, you know that's just a fact of the matter. Um, as always, go to our website the c26triathlon dot com and there's a one stop shop for all things coaching camps and community. If you need anything from the man, the myth, the legend, Mike Torali, he's available, crushingiron at gmail.com. If you need uh, top 10 tips to be a better weightlifter, I'm available. C26coach at gmail.com. <laughs> All right, man, go uh, crush that iron. I'm just going to. I'm going to go get my swole on. All right, buddy. I will see you next time. See you.